views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Get fired up for Spirit Fire Radio with your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Get ready to shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in these modern times. Bring purpose to your life through practical spirituality and add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Hello and welcome to Spirit Fire Radio. My name is Steve Kramer and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Dorothy Riddle. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Steve. Good to be here. Uh, it's so great to be with you and back again with Spirit Fire Radio. We're talking about hope this whole month and it's been so interesting. This is our second show and you know, if I could speak for both of us, I, I'm starting to put it all together as I do, you know, show after show, it like warms me up to the theme. And if I could speak for both of us, both of our educational organizations, we teach that the modern spiritual path is equal parts, heart and mind. And both of those reveal these universal truths that we're all connected. We're all part of a greater reality. We talked about that a lot last month when we talked about the human condition. And, you know, we're, we're, we're a part of something that's bigger than our own individual experience. And so as we open the door to these truths, it's like the heart opens the door and our mind sort of takes us through the door. And these truths are all so inspiring. And that's what's really inspiring about uh you know, about the spiritual path, there's sort of this limitless feeling to truth and it's hopeful. So I've sort of put that together that, you know, hope is sort of there. It's omnipresent. And as we are confronted with the truth, we see that actually the sort of components of the universe are really working uh, for us and with us for our own evolution. And, and all of that's really hopeful. <laughs> what do you think, Dorothy? I think that's great. I think that's great. Um, I've got a quote that I'd like to also start us off with uh, as a companion to what you just summarized for us, Steve. Is that okay? Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Okay. It's from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. And I just love that tension between the finite and the infinite. Mm. And well, that's isn't that a lot of the spiritual path, right? It's that we're here on this individual journey, but yet we're all on it together. So it's that finite. And sometimes, you know, being on the path of our own path feels a little we're out there on our own. And certainly life can present us with disappointments. Yeah, but hope is infinite. So if we just keep persevering, huh? That's right. That's right. And if we keep remembering that we're actually not out there on our own. We are part of a greater whole, as you mentioned, and that's a very important aspect of uh, understanding our spiritual path and our spiritual evolution. Definitely, yeah. Sometimes, though, you know, that, that disappointment, it, it can feel that way, and that's what's been interesting about our discussion about hope was that we talked about it not necessarily being a feeling, and sometimes our feeling lets us know that we've got to look bigger, that we've got to go bigger. You know, we've got to get, we've got to see beyond this limitation sometimes, you know, the, the finite qualities of our existence and go for the infinite. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll just add uh, one of the, uh, one of the sayings or teachings <laughs> from the Ageless Wisdom is that joy, joyfulness, is the basic note of our solar system. Mm. So when we are oriented towards joy, which is, uh, you, you might call that uh, super hope, right? <laughs> uh, that sense of, of being just in, in the now, in the everything, um, with infinite possibilities, that is us. That is who we actually are. 
<laughs> it seems like it seems like hope is sometimes the engine. It's kind of like the force that moves us along. And every now and again, we get to pull over at the scenic view, you know, and that's when we. <laughs> <laughs> but so this whole show today, we're going to talk about why hope is challenging. You know, like, why aren't we in joy all the time? If 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 joy is this main ingredient of our sort of experience of of our, you said, of our solar system or of our universe of our solar system. Of our solar system, basic note of our solar system. Yeah. So why aren't we feeling it all the time? You know, that's what we're going to talk about a bit in this show. Like, what is it about our human existence that mm-hmm. is so challenging to us sometimes? Mm-hmm. And I think, Steve, uh, one of the things that is uh, important for us to tackle is how people feel about uncertainty. Because if everything is certain, if everything is predetermined, if everything is causally laid out, there's no room for growth. There's no room for new possibilities. And hope is about finding those alternatives, those, those ways of exploring and expanding. And so uncertainty goes hand in hand. And it's, it's a kind of an unsettling feeling that we need to be okay with, be comfortable with. Right. We talked about that a lot in January shows that, that really change is inevitable, that, that we will constantly be evolving. Otherwise we'd be sitting next to dinosaurs, right? (laughs) I mean, that evolution happens, change happens, and not just in a physical way in our planet earth, but really we evolve emotionally and spiritually, mentally. And yeah, sometimes if we're not sort of moving along with that, we can get we can hit a snag. Right, right. So you got to be uncertainty. You've got to realize, you know, that that we will sometimes be uncertain. And what does uncertainty lead to? Well, it leads to certainty, <laughs> which then leads to more temporary uncertainty. certainty. Right. Temporary right. certainty. More <laughs> It, it makes me think of uh, it makes me think a little bit of Annie. You know, the sun will come out tomorrow. It seems to be like the hope anthem, right? I mean, because if we really uh, if we didn't understand cycles and that cycles actually lead to some sort of evolution and to process that process is really an important aspect of our evolution. That the sun goes down, the sun will come up tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that it will come, <laughs> and that it will. Right. But well, but let's think about it this way: it will come up. It might be clouded over. <laughs> right, right. Right. We might not see it. It might be shining brightly in a clear blue sky. Uh, so there's an uncertainty about how. There's no uncertainty about whether it will emerge, but there is uncertainty about how it will emerge. Well, and isn't that interesting when you think about that in terms of the quote that you you said at the beginning, you said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. You could sort of relate that directly to what you just said. We might have said, oh, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And although it looks like the sun is up because it's day, we might not see the sun because it's cloudy. And then we might get disappointed because, oh, Mm -hmm. we had expectations or we had some plan that involved sun, (laughs) like our idea of the sun. And it's, it's not so much that, you know, the sun will come out again in the future without clouds, but how do we deal with that disappointment? Or is it even really worthy of being a disappointment? You know, it's how do we approach, uh, that uncertainty and then a certainty that might not be exactly how we thought it was going to be. Right. Because, uh, you know, what you're getting at, I think is the whole issue, the whole role of interpretation that we participate in creating our reality, and part of how we do that is in the way that we interpret what's going on around us. Uh, if we interpret um, uncertainty as negative, as bad, as uh, so uncomfortable that you know we've got to move past it, and we interpret certainty as good, then we're going to be stuck. Right, we can't ever move anywhere because we have to stay just with that one pres- prescribed way of being. Yes, indeed. So that 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 sort of says that life will actually life will create sort of finite situations for us to then confront and and ask 
well, what do we do with that? You know, how adaptable are we or, or how do we approach it? And, that, you know, isn't that really at the crux of, of, of our own personal evolution? You know, isn't that what's in question there? That's right. And if we, you know, if we put that in the framework of hope, the, the learning for us, the challenge for us is persistence. Mm. Um, and what, you know, uh, I know we're going to explore this more together uh, today, but the whole idea that uh, if you try something and it doesn't work and you give up, right? That's what feeling hopeless is all about. Persistence is about trying again and again and again and understanding that that is the only way in which uh, we actually do grow. We do, we do change and that we are open to that kind of uncertainty and ability to change. Definitely. There's movement. Yeah, there's one thing I've learned, and, I, and I'm really starting to, to, to get in touch with, with hope, is that it is really about movement. It's about momentum and options. And mm-hmm. so how do we not, how do we not, how do we not become finite? <laughs> how do we stay infinite beings, you know, how do we keep momentum going within hope? Mm -hmm. Wow. So Dorothy, let's, we're going to go to a break in a minute. And then I want to talk about that. Like when we've got a bit, when we see a barrier, how do we not get stuck? You know, it seems like, uh, barriers think that get in the way of, of hoping, make it challenging. How do we get around them and keep it moving and, and, and keep happy about that and stay creative. Sounds good. Great. Sounds excellent. (laughs) We'll be right back. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit JenRoyster.com for more information. Get ready to experience Truth Talk Radio with host Deb Acker. Tune in to Truth Talk Radio each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com to illuminate the truth in your daily life as you experience life, love, and abundance from a whole new perspective. This hit show will leave you feeling lighter and bring you into a place of infinite possibilities every day in every way. Visit TruthTalkRadioShow.com for upcoming transformative topics and guests. Want to help reduce the divisiveness in our world? Each year, the School for Esoteric Studies holds a subjective group conference. This year, our focus is on unity and diversity, the science of right human relations. From April till June, we will meditate together, study relevant writings, and share practical strategies for improving how we relate with each other. Join us to help build inclusive communities. Check on our subjective group conference at esotericstudies.net. That's the school for esoteric studies at esotericstudies.net. Are you looking for the perfect setting for your next workshop or retreat? At Spirit Fire Meditative Retreat Center, cultivating consciousness is what we do best. Our guests count on us to create an atmosphere that supports serenity and well-being. We lead from the heart and create space for the mind. Freshly prepared meals designed with local and organic ingredients, 95 acres of beautiful woods and pastures, and a facility built with green in mind. This is what you'll find at Spirit Fire. For more information, visit SpiritFireRetreatCenter.com. 
Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Welcome back, everyone, to Spirit Fire Radio. We are talking today about hope again and why hope is challenging. And just before the break, uh, we were talking about the kinds of barriers that that come up for us when uh, we feel that uh, things are uncertain, when we feel that vulnerability. Um, But Steve, before we, we actually dive in, to this really interesting topic, let's just introduce ourselves to the audience. Is that okay? That's great. Okay. So uh, I'll take a lead. Um, I'm Dorothy Riddle. I am the chairperson of the board of directors of the School for Esoteric Studies. The School for Esoteric Studies is collaborating with Spirit Fire Radio on this radio program. And the School for Esoteric Studies... um, is an educational institution that offers structured discipleship training, esoteric training, uh, to persons who are interested in furthering their own spiritual growth. You can find out more about what we do at esotericstudies.net. That's esotericstudies.net. Awesome. And I'm a part of Spiritfire, which is the other half of our collaboration, both of us supporting Spirit Fire Radio. So Spirit Fire, uh, we offer uh, spiritual training as well. Our main focus is meditation. We've got the practice of living awareness, which is Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, which is free online, a wonderful 14-step program that you can do on your own, uh, training in, in every level of meditation. We've got entry level, intermediate, and generative. So Check it all out at spiritfire.com and spiritfireradio.com to find out what Dorothy and I are going to be up to for this entire season. We're only two months into it, and we've got a year's worth of topics. Every month, we're going to take on a new topic, and they are really just juicy. We're going to cover every aspect of these topics and as they relate to the spiritual path, and one will build on the next, and by the end of the year, who knows, Dorothy? We're just going to have a recipe for, you know, really navigating this thing called the spiritual path. It's going to be quite something. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So really, both of our, what both of our organizations are really interested in, in is, is this concept of, of how do we cope with barriers? You know, because that is really an important aspect of, of the way in which we grow spiritually. We confront challenges and we find a way around them. We find a way through them and we become stronger. We become more learned. We become more knowledgeable and insightful. And really that helps us really stay connected to our higher self, to each other, and, and generally just lead a more productive and peaceful and happy and centered life, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'd like to share with our listeners, Steve, some of the, the research that I think is relevant on the whole topic of hope. Uh, awesome. Because there's some really interesting studies comparing people who are high on hope that is strong in terms of hope and those that are low. And a couple of key differences. The main one is that high hope people focus on learning goals. In other words, they're orienting towards growth and improvement. And they see barriers as challenges to overcome that will help them on that learning path. By contrast, low hope people focus on mastery goals, that is getting good at something, not not learning new things necessarily. They choose easy tasks that don't provide a challenge, and if they fail, or when they fail, then they quit. They feel like they don't have any control over what's going to happen. So... There's a, a, a researcher called Goldman who looked at students uh, at different levels of hope. And what he found was that um, 
if the student was having difficulty academically, students with high hope would say, well, I'm going to work harder. And they came up with a wide range of different strategies that they could use in order to improve their final grade. Students with moderate levels of hope thought of several ways to improve their grade, but uh, they, they weren't as wide ranging, they weren't as creative, and the students themselves weren't as uh, persistent in pursuing them. By contrast, the students with low levels of hope just gave up. You know, if their grade wasn't good now, they didn't see that there was anything that they could do to actually pull it together to improve their final grade, and they uh, reported feeling completely demoralized. So these students were all in the same situation. They all had the same barrier to overcome, um, but they approached it very, very differently. Hmm. What what I find interesting about that is one is really focused only on the prize. You know, one is focused only on the grade. So again, there's this side of, sort of finite quality. It's It feels very almost like if we're thinking about the physical plane existence, like we're just looking at the grade seem to be the low hope people in what you were saying. And with the high hope people, they sort of saw the whole process as making them a a sort of a, the outcome was going to serve them better. Like they had a wider breadth of perspective. So it seems like that seems to be the crux with low hope and high hope is one is really focused only on the immediate. It's sort of like if you're, if your carburetor breaks in your car and you say, well, goodness, I've got a broken carburetor and I've just got to fix it. And maybe I don't have a lot of money to fix the carburetor. Whereas if a high hope person's carburetor broke, they'd think, well, I'm going to learn about my fuel injection system. And they sort of would see that problem as an opportunity to learn something greater than mm-hmm. just carburetor. So what do you think, you know, how do you think the ho hope, the low hope people evolve their sort of, or expand the breadth of their perspective? What do you think they might do? (laughs) Well, I think that, I think one of the things is recognizing that, that this is a learned skill, right? It's not, it's not an emotional state that just happens to you. It is a matter of learning and of practice and of, and, and of persistence of not giving up. Um, Steve, I'd like to give a personal example, if I could, uh, sure. to just uh, kind of illustrate this process, uh, take it out of the academic. Um, back in the fall of 2016, I became aware as someone that I myself have some uh, mobility limitations, and I became aware that there was no research, no data, and no accommodation guidelines for people like me who can walk, but only a short distance, and can stand unsupported, but only for a short time. And our whole environment is set up assuming that people will walk, uh, you know, moderate to long distances and be able to stand in line for 10, 15, 20 minutes. So I started looking around. I couldn't find, I started talking to researchers people doing research on uh, uh, physical mobility disabilities were um, mildly interested, but really not interested in including this in their studies. They had their own focus. Um, I talked with policy people. They said, oh, it's kind of interesting, but there's no data. I mean, what would we really do? I talked with people who were supposed to be advocating for persons with disabilities, um, and they all had their own agenda. They, you know, they weren't that interested in moving forward. I spent from September till early January trying all different routes, trying to figure out what it was, you know, uh, what could happen. And it, I finally realized in January of this year that um, there was another option, and it was an option that I could take charge of. I could myself work through the various surveys that were available on disability. I could create a survey. I could put it online on a website. I could start publicizing it and getting people to respond. And as of yesterday, over 2,400 people have responded. 
The data has been analyzed. Now, it's still ongoing. We still want more people involved. But for the first time, we now have statistically validated data on the fact that people who can only walk a short distance can walk about one school bus, 35 feet, and can stand comfortably about one to two minutes. And so that can be used with policymakers to begin to make a change in people's lives. Wow, that is so remarkable. Congratulations. And I, I, I'm, I just got chills because I knew that you were doing this and how amazing that you had such a swift response. I mean, that is really incredible. Wow. And, and w- would you say that you have been hopeful through this whole process? Well, I would say, and I think that this is important, I would say that generally I was hopeful, but I had periods of being very disappointed and very discouraged Ah. because I would try a particular path that I thought was going to work and it didn't. And I would try something else that theoretically ought to have worked and it didn't. And I would try to get sponsorships. I would try to get... um, you know, support. Um, So I think it's important when we talk about hope that it's, it's not a, it's not a smooth path. Yeah. It's not, it's not that you start out and you say, Oh, I'm a hopeful person, you know, and I know everything's going to be just fine. So yeah, I know I'm going to have to try three or four things, but everything's going to be great. Um, It's harder than that. Dorothy, let's go to a break. I, we're going to have to go to the break for uh, any second now, but I want to I want to ask you several questions about that. This is really juicy. <laughs> we're going to be right back, <laughs> and we're going to pick up this conversation right where we left off. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. What if your body and mind were the compasses to the secrets, mysteries, and magic of life? Glenna Rice, co-host of The Questionable Parent, is inviting you to access all that is possible. Glenna is a 10-year certified veteran access consciousness facilitator who offers an amazing variety of life-changing classes and workshops. Work with Glenna from anywhere with teleclasses and workshops all over the globe. To learn more and see Glenna's current schedule of events, classes, and workshops, visit GlennaRice.com. Interested in deepening your spiritual practice? The School for Esoteric Studies offers online training to spiritual seekers from all paths of life and individual coaching. Our courses synthesize Eastern and Western spiritual traditions based on meditation, study, and service applied to everyday life. To learn more about our courses and services, please visit www.esotericstudies.net. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. Awareness is universal. Establishing a living awareness through meditation brings peaceful, healthy, and creative well-being into your everyday life. The practice of living awareness, Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, is built on this belief and is designed for every level of practitioner. Each year, Spirit Fire hosts living awareness meditation retreats that allow you to explore the practice in depth at our retreat center in beautiful western Massachusetts. Introduce yourself to meditation and the practice at the Foundations Retreat. Attend, in silence, a silent meditation retreat focused on mindfulness, presence, and nature. Or be engaged with the meditation sittings themselves at the Deepening Retreat. 
Start adding to your awareness and attend a meditation retreat designed to cultivate consciousness in your everyday life. For details on attending a Living Awareness Meditation Retreat, visit upcoming events at www.spiritfire.com. Welcome back to Spirit Fire Radio. Just before the break, Dorothy was telling us about a really wonderful achievement of collecting data for persons with disabilities that limit their ability to stand or walk for long distances or for long periods of time. Dorothy, again, congratulations on collecting all of this data. And just before the break, we were talking about your sense of hope and were you feeling hopeful throughout the process? Uh, what I find really interesting and what I'd love to hear whether this is the case for you, did you have a vision of what the world might look like if this were incorporated into um, into scenarios where, where it was a consideration at airports or at bus stops or in public spaces? I mean, did you have a vision of, of ways in which you saw everybody being helped by this? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Steve, because I would say I did and I didn't. Um, I did have a sense that this could make a difference for many, many people. And, and in fact, there are unfortunately stories of people who have died because they were forced to walk further than they comfortably could, than they safely could. Uh, so I knew it was an important issue. It was an important issue for me. Um, and on the website, I'll just mention hidden disability, I, I'm sorry, hidden mobility disabilities.com. There is a section there on what possible accommodations could be. But the reason I say no is that I've learned over time that if you want to bring something into being, you need to have a general vision, but you need to be open to that vision changing as you go forward. Yeah, yeah. And, and this to me is related to the spiritual concept of detachment. Yes. That you want, you know, that, that you envision what is good for the whole, but you detach from the specifics of how it might come about. Right. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Well, you know, that's just great news. And, and I, 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 I bring that up because I think that, that that is a real key ingredient of being hopeful is, is, is seeing, is knowing you've got a goal, you know, of, of, of not, of taking it beyond yourself and saying, all right, I've got mobility issues. So the low hope person would just say, all right, I can't travel, right, Dorothy? Like, mm -hmm. all right, I right. simply have to stay home. And that would be somebody who actually is on the, you know, th they might be experiencing fear. They might be experiencing, um, you know, hopelessness and, and kind of like low vibration, emotional scale and hopelessness is an aspect of that, even though it's not, we've said it's not an emotion, but for somebody to actually say, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to see the barrier, which is I can't stand for more than five, 10 minutes. And, um, here are our solutions, you know, here are ways that we as a society, and I know there are more people out there than me could look at that and, and look at that, the universe how many people did you say have, have filled out this? Well, there's been uh, 2,400 have responded so far, but we're looking for more because we want to get the full range, uh, age range and multiple countries. Well, keep on keeping on. That sounds mm -hmm. it's great. You just led me to think, you know, we're, we talked about the low sort of low vibration of, of feeling hopelessness. Is, is often I find associated with fear and with powerlessness. It makes me think of, for instance, when I was younger, I was involved in ACT UP. I lived in New York City in the late 80s and early 90s when the AIDS epidemic was just, uh, it was basically like living in a civil war zone. Uh, I lost so many friends and so many loved ones. And Within that community, there was a real sense of of fear, of hopelessness, of of limitation. You know, a bit of what you were talking about before, and and how do we get beyond that? And people really um, they gave into it, and it was the ones who moved beyond the fear and the hopelessness. And a lot of them found 
anger. You know, when we look at different emotions, some of them, although we wouldn't say, for instance, that anger is hopeful, if you're angry as a direct sort of response to feeling hopeless or feeling powerless, there's hope involved there because anger actually gets movement. It, 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 cre- it generates action. And it makes me think of ACT UP because, you know, even the name ACT UP is uh, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. So there was momentum there. That community was really feeling like they just weren't being met by the government at the time. You know, the government in the late 80s and early 90s, in the late 80s especially, wouldn't even acknowledge AIDS. And they um, would acknowledge their disdain for the gay community, but they wouldn't acknowledge AIDS. And when you put that together, you thought in the community, you really thought, wow, this is this is really bad for us. And the community really got angry. And that was motivating. And that anger actually led to a really amazing outcome where people started to become aware um, of of this uh, virus. They became aware of uh, the need for the government to step in and start doing clinical trials. And in the end, you see today that this is a manageable uh, disease for many, for those who in, in, you know, in, in, um, really that aren't in a third world uh, environment, but ACT UP was, was really, was, was really um, a hopeful, what I would call an interesting case because there was a lot of hope there, but the main drive was anger. So isn't that, that's kind of Mm -hmm. interesting. It it is, but I would, I would guess that anger only took you so far. Totally. Totally. Because anger by itself is more of a reactive uh, response. And you have to, one of the key components of of hope is moving into being proactive and seeing options. And And anger tends to shut that down. Yes, it's exactly what happened. And and options became available. And it's a lot like the unfolding of what was happening uh, with, in your situation as well, it's what made me think of that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And people within the community who stayed with the anger. You know, that's a very interesting component. And it's actually something I sense we're going to talk about in future shows because it's it's glamour. So this word glamour, it's when you become defined by an emotion or an emotional state. So there were certainly people in that community that they couldn't let go of the anger. And other people moved on. They were working towards um, working towards positive outcomes and solutions. And people that that were really getting a lot of attention and there was a part, an aspect of them that was being fulfilled by that anger. And, uh, it, it wasn't good news, uh, for them. So you've got to keep moving and you've got to keep, uh, evolving within the process. That's right. That's right. And the, uh, you've made a really important point, Steve, I think the, because the, the initial response is fear and fear can be very debilitating. It can freeze, you know, if you think about being fearful, think about the the deer in the headlights kind of feeling, right? You're just kind of frozen. Um, whereas anger energizes you uh, chemically. I mean, just in the body, it, it energizes you. So it is a more active step than being fearful. It's just that then it needs to be supplemented by that ability to... Uh, embrace the positive of what is of what the possibilities are indeed and you know dorothy my goodness we're going to say this all year long i know it that it is really engaging the higher mind you've really got to engage abstract thought you've got to engage you've got to engage the mind that is creative you know you've really mm. got to tap into a higher sense of the mental plane you know there's so many sort of um evolutionary biologists that talk about uh, our, our reptilian brain and, and the, the amygdala that we actually have in many ways outgrown the fight or flight response that, that we use it in ways that, that we aren't, necess- aren't necessary, that we perceive danger in ways in these modern times that isn't actually real and that we've got to actually employ our higher mind. We've got to employ reason and we've got to um, – look beyond fear and find ways to either look at it realistically or to move beyond it and create scenarios that it just doesn't come up for us so much. Does that make sense? It, it does. And let me put it slightly differently. 
we know from research that the uh, that the chemical response the, that we associate with emotion is the first response of the body. Uh, I mean, it, it happens virtually instantaneously, and so we can be taken over by that by, by that emotion, and that emotion may feel like fear, it may feel like anger. What we forget is that we attribute the meaning to the emotion. Right. We label the emotion. And so I can practice, I can learn to label that, that initial response as, ooh, this is a good trigger for me to start thinking of options. Right, right. I can label it however I want. And that's, that is the bringing the, the higher mind, as you were saying, into it. But it's very important for us to recognize that we actually are the ones that are in charge. We're the ones that are in control. We are the ones through the power of naming that determine how we experience something. But that's a very conscious act though, right? We need to underscore that at all times, that that is a very conscious act. And it. Yeah. It is it is a conscious act, Steve. But but the important thing about practice, and I think in both of our schools, you know, we we have meditation, we have study, we have service, and and the theme running through all of that is practice, practice, practice. The practice has to do with how are you going to respond in the moment, in the emergency, right? That's why people who are first responders. Practice, practice. They, they have to know what their immediate response is going to be, not just leave it to chance. And we, we can all do that in relation to that chemical uh, influx that we get. We can decide what it is and practice so that it is, it is not conscious. It, is, it becomes a reflex for us. Oh, it's why our meditation training is called the practice of living awareness. You got right. practice living awareness into being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so listen, we're going to go to a break. We'll be right back and uh, we're going to wrap it up on hope. And I, I, I've loved this conversation so far, Dorothy. It's just gone super fast. <laughs> we'll be yes, right. It has. We'll be right back. Tune in to Dynamics of Diversity Radio, scripting the new narrative for immigration with leading experts, Kripa Upadhyay and Steve Tanijo on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This show will remove the noise that often accompanies discussions on this topic and share a new perspective on the dynamics of immigration and diversity, ever reminding us that together we are all at the core of innovation, excellence, and positive change. Visit OrbitLawPLLC.com for upcoming topics. Awareness is universal. Establishing a living awareness through meditation brings peaceful, healthy, and creative well-being into your everyday life. The practice of living awareness, Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, is built on this belief and is designed for every level of practitioner. Each year, Spirit Fire hosts living awareness meditation retreats that allow you to explore the practice in depth at our retreat center in beautiful western Massachusetts. Introduce yourself to meditation and the practice at the Foundation's Retreat. Attend, in silence, a silent meditation retreat focused on mindfulness, presence, and nature. Or be engaged with the meditation sittings themselves at the Deepening Retreat. Start adding to your awareness and attend a meditation retreat designed to cultivate consciousness in your everyday life. For details on attending a Living Awareness Meditation Retreat, visit upcoming events at www.spiritfire.com. Gifted intuitive healer and spiritual teacher, Sarah Luce, brings her unique style to the hit show, Small Steps, Big Breakthrough Radio, on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in each month as Sarah turns reality on end and shows us how to experience expansive results with simple yet powerful steps. Expect an enlightening bend on what you currently believe is possible. For show details and upcoming topics, visit saraloose.com. That's S-A-R-A-L-O-O-S dot com. 
Want to help reduce the divisiveness in our world? Each year, the School for Esoteric Studies holds a subjective group conference. This year, our focus is on unity and diversity, the science of right human relations. From April till June, we will meditate together, study relevant writings, and share practical strategies for improving how we relate with each other. Join us to help build inclusive communities. Check on our subjective group conference at esotericstudies.net. That's the School for Esoteric Studies at esotericstudies.net. Welcome back to Spirit Fire Radio. Dorothy and I have been in a really enlightening conversation about hope and why it can be so challenging. You know, we, we have all we all want to be hopeful, and then sometimes you just turn around and where did it go? So we're we're trying to um, talk quite a bit about about how we manage emotions. What do they mean, and how can we engage the mind in a way that practices being hopeful? Mm-hmm. And that that whole idea of practice is so important. That's what we left off on just before the break, Steve. That we we have the ability to train ourselves to think of options, to train ourselves to be hopeful, to train ourselves to attribute positive or empowering. Doesn't have to be positive, but empowering meaning to what we're experiencing in our body and not be driven by uh, whatever chemical responses are occurring. It gets complicated, right? I mean, emotions are a big deal. You know, we, you know, within esoteric healing, which is a form of energy medicine that, that I teach it, it is said that 90% of our physical dis ease is the result of the emotional body that it is really our response mechanism. How do we respond to situations? You were talking about first responders and it was first responders and the importance of practice. So, you know, that's really an aspect of it. Our emotions are, are something sometimes that we, I was going to say, are something to contend with, but I'd like to say that there's sometimes something to contend with. Yeah. Well, or we can think of our, our emotions, um, uh, coming at it from the esoteric perspective, emotion warms energy. Mm. Uh, Mental energy by itself um, can be uh, a a bit bland. It doesn't mean that it can't be focused, it can't be um, helpful, but it is most effective when it is warmed by emotion appropriately. Um, You think about... um, well, think about dough. Like if, like if you're cooking, and if it's really cold, it's almost hard. It's very difficult to manipulate. But uh, as you, as it comes to room temperature, as you massage it and it gets warmer, it becomes very pliant. You know what I mean? Yes, totally. And it's like thinking of ice as ice starts to melt. It's got it's got so many different forms. You know, it goes to liquid and then it goes to steam. That really. Mm-hmm wide variety of states. And I love thinking of the emotions as, as warming something that that's nice. Um, I also find it interesting that as we move up the emotional scale, you know, we, we can feel that as if we, we were talking earlier about fear, we were talking about a sort of a powerlessness, uh, certain feelings that, that keep us sort of feeling stuck and cut off from the rest of the world or cut off from our sense of interconnection. And what I find interesting is as we move up the emotional scale, we start to see that the mind starts to sort of integrate into our emotions. Like when we think of joy, you were talking about joy. We had said that hope is not necessarily an emotion. We think of wonder, being in a state of wonder, that there are actually mental qualities to that that start to integrate. 
And so I find that that those are sort of um, that is a state of being that's been warmed. You know, there's much more to it. And when we're in a state of wonder, hope, uh, joy, we actually can sense how we feel connected to the world around us. But when we're in fear, we are really isolated and it becomes so much about ourself and our own particular survival. So I find that interesting. Yeah, well, I think we, I think it's really can be useful to remember that what psychologists say about emotion is that there are six big emotions, and traditionally, uh, the way they've been defined and they've been studied as being specific emotional states is anger, sadness, fear, disgust, surprise, and happiness. And what's interesting to me about that list is that happiness is really the only positive one. <laughs> so in other words, we're more aware of the negative states, right? We have more practice in the negative states than we have in in the positive. And happiness is what is engendered by hope, right? Mm. Um, but we need, we need, I think, more practice in the nuances of the positive end of the emotional scale. So we don't just have one out of six available to us. Right. And, you know, when you think of happiness, it's really kind of the high point of our own personal development, because what makes me happy, Dorothy, doesn't necessarily make you happy. And mm -hmm. in a, it's that idea that we're all facets of this diamond. You know, we, we all have this particular individual offering and as we move up that scale, when we get to happiness, you know, that, that really is saying, ah, okay, here's what I am going to, at least I like to think of happiness as, as something, as my personal offering to the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems personal and, and yeah, indeed. Um, I am wonder, I, or I not wonder what was the one you, you mentioned surprise. Surprise. Mm -hmm. that, that interested me. I'm sure some people think surprise is good. That's a good way to tell whether you're low hope or high hope. When you hear the word <laughs> surprise, does that make you go, oh no, or does it make you say yes? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dorothy, I think we're going to have to take this to the next show. I'm glad we're doing a, a whole month on hope. We're going to talk next week about how we develop our hopefulness muscles. Like how do we, how, now that we know what can get in the way of hope, and we've talked a little bit about it on this show, you know, ways ways to generate hope when we when we've you know hit a wall or we've we're in front of a barrier so next week we're going to talk about ways to to bring it on you know ways to develop hope great so listeners Dorothy, uh, our, our email, we would love to hear from people. If anybody has questions uh, about perhaps the relationship of esotericism to hope or even esotericism to, uh, <laughs> to spirituality itself, or if you have anything to say about what we've talked about thus far, you can send an email to spiritfireradio at spiritfire.com. You could also go to spiritfireradio.com, and that'll tell you all about the upcoming shows. You can listen to archived shows, and uh, there's a button there also to send us an email. So we hope you'll do that. Dorothy, any final words you want to sum up for us? Uh, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to next week. I think it'll be really uh, – I think it's apparent from our discussions today that uh, how we train ourselves, how we – think about uh, our experiences uh, has a lot to do with whether we are high hope or low hope people. Yes, indeed. I am hopeful that we are going to have the entire <laughs> subject of hope covered by the end of March. <laughs> One thing that, that really has stuck out and just to, to just perhaps end it with this is almost a summary of the last couple of weeks. You know, is to say, oh, I really hope we cover – if I had said, Dorothy, I really hope we cover everything about hope, which I didn't think about. That would be a nervousness that, oh, my goodness, maybe we're not going to cover everything about hope. <laughs> but instead, I said, I am hopeful that this topic is going to be fully covered by the end of the month. So I'm getting there, Dorothy. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. great talking with you, Steve. It's great talking with you, and we will be back next week on Spirit Fire Radio. Thanks for joining us, everybody. 
Thank you for listening to Spirit Fire Radio. Tune in each Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern for your weekly guide to purposeful living and practical spirituality. Join hosts Steve Kramer and Dorothy Riddle as they shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in your everyday life. Add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. To learn more, visit spiritfireradio.com. Want to help reduce the divisiveness in our world? Each year, the School for Esoteric Studies holds a subjective group conference. This year, our focus is on unity and diversity, the science of right human relations. From April till June, we will meditate together, study relevant writings, and share practical strategies for improving how we relate with each other. Join us to help build inclusive communities. Check on our subjective group conference at esotericstudies.net. That's the School for Esoteric Studies at esotericstudies.net.